Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. On December 1st, the RBI started a pilot program to and announced the digital the retail digital rupee. Now to talk about what this means and what are the implications of having a digital rupee, we have with us Shailesh Chitnish. Shailesh, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hey Bharat, so this is Shailesh Chitnish and I'm a fellow in the High Tech Geopolitics program here at Takshishila. Okay, cool. Uh, so Shailesh has been with us on uh, ATP before and uh, it's always nice uh, talking to him in at Takshila as well. So before we start, I'd like to plug that we have admissions which are open for our GCPP and PTP programs. So the GCPP is a 12-week program and we offer it in three different specializations, the tech and policy, defense and foreign affairs and advanced public policy. The PGP on the other hand is a year-long program that ta- takes you much deeper and gives you a much nuanced understanding of public policy. So you can head over to school.takshila.org.in to find out more and apply. So if you like the stuff, if you like the stuff that we talk about on this, pod, on this podcast, I'm sure you'll definitely enjoy these uh, programs. So do check it out. So now coming back to what we're going to discuss. So the RBI has started this pilot of the digital rupee. And a month before this announcement, they had also announced the a pilot of the wholesale digital rupee, which is more targeted at uh, commercial institutions. So now the digital rupee is a form of a central bank digital currency or a CBDC. And uh, there are a bunch of other countries that are also running project uh, pilot projects of CBDCs. These include China, Russia, Australia, and a lot of other countries. And a few countries have also already launched CBDCs such as Nigeria, Bahamas, Jamaica, and some other Caribbean states. And so it becomes important to discuss what's going on here because of a a recent announcement by the Nigerian Central Bank, which issued a directive that limits ATM cash withdrawals by individuals and businesses, 45 US dollars per day or 225 US dollars per week. Now, this move is intended to push for greater adoption of CBDCs and move towards a cashless economy. So this is something that is happening across the world. And Nigeria has taken a step to greatly incentivize the move to CBDCs. So to understand what the RBI is doing and what its implications are for the Indian economy, we'd like to discuss about this. So Shailesh, uh, what is the digital rupee and uh, what is what is a wholesale digital rupee and how is it different from a retail digital rupee? Could you uh, talk us through these uh, concepts? Sure. So uh, I think first and foremost, if you think about the digital rupee, think about it just like you would think about the currency, the one rupee or the 100 rupee note, uh, except it's in digital form. So the digital rupee is essentially a legal tender that is issued by the RBI. And it is same as the paper rupee and is exchangeable one to one with it. Like I said, it's just that the form is digital or tokenized. But there are some features about the digital currency itself that are worth understanding. So first is every unit of the digital rupee can be uniquely identified. So much like your currency, which has those uh, serial numbers on it, which are unique, the digital currency itself will have a unique identifier. And so in that sense, it is quite different from your regular electronic money transfers like UPI or NEFT, which are more like digital representations of the currency rather than representing one particular unit of currency, right? So that's the first thing. Second is the transactions on this digital rupee will be recorded on a database. So typically it's going to be a distributed ledger, similar to what we are familiar with blockchain. So every transaction is going to be recorded there. And third, uh, and this again, the third point is is something that has kind of not been explored fully, but digital currencies can be programmable, which means that your ordinary currency is just a store of value. Whereas digital currency, by virtue of it being digital, you can add on additional use cases like you can define certain time windows during which it's kind of uh, valid, uh, define the use cases for which it will be valid, define transferability. So there are a whole host of additional programming features 
that you could potentially add on to this digital currency. And again, I'm using the word potential because none of these have been really explored at scale. So this is more of a theoretical ability rather than something that's been done in practice. And while we're talking about digital currency, I think uh, you also mentioned this, Bharat, that the digital rupee, as has been launched in 1st of December and the wholesale version 1st of uh, November, that's just a pilot launch. This is just, I think, RBI testing the waters to see what does it look like, what is the reaction. And so I think we can expect changes over a period of time as it starts to evolve. So that is a little bit about uh, digital rupee, what it is. Now, when the RBI released the digital rupee, it came out in two different versions. One version was for wholesale transactions. Think about this as typically your interbank movement of money or movement between the banks and the RBI, which is more to do with settlements um, and kind of transfer of funds, things like that. And the second is retail, which is something that is available to ordinary users like you and me, private businesses, non-financial businesses, so on and so forth. So the wholesale version that operates through kind of accounts that commercial banks have with the Indian Central Bank, the RBI. So that is basically between the banks themselves. That is not something that we are purview to. Whereas something for the retail users, you can think of it as very similar to what we do with UPI. With UPI, we don't transact with the central bank. Uh, we have an intermediary bank through which we have a UPI account, and that is the basis for the transactions. So for retail users, the digital rupee is going to have a very similar experience. Uh, there will be kind of mandated banks which will issue the tokens, and we will transact with the banks, and the banks will be our intermediary. So there's not going to be a direct relationship between the consumer and the RBI. We will still be using the banking system as our intermediary. So that, I think, uh, gives a good overview of what the digital rupee is and what are the different formats. Right. Uh, Shaliz, when you were just uh, mentioning about how the digital rupee will be issued in the same denominations as the physical currency notes that we have, is there any reason for this? Just curious as, you know, it doesn't need it. Yeah, sorry. So I didn't mean in the same denomination. I was just thinking, I was just uh, implying that think of it as very similar to a digital currency as example. So yeah, there's no, it's not going to be the same denominations. Okay. And uh, these are, uh, so as a retail user, you are going to be using the banks as intermediaries, uh, even for the digital rupee. It's not um, a direct uh, transaction with the RBI. Correct. And that's, I think, a very important point because theoretically, if you think about it, this opens up the door for consumers or ordinary citizens to have a direct claim on RBI, right? which would be pretty transformative. But again, I don't think we're going anywhere close to that right now. We are still sticking with our regular financial system with the bank as an intermediary. But again, in the theoretical realm, that could be possible where you could start transacting with the RBI itself, which again has implications in terms of when you think about um, kind of transmission of monetary policy, so on and so forth, right? But again, uh, getting ahead of ourselves there. Right. Okay, uh, so coming back to, okay, a lot of banks around the world seem to be showing interest in at least uh, having pilots or even deploying, I mean, developing a central bank currency, a digital currency. So what are the motivations of these uh, of these banks and what do the, what is the benefit that they see from moving to a, a digital currency? Yes, so I can speak specifically to the RBI because they've been fairly um, kind of open about what their motivations are. So if you think about the RBI, one of the things we can agree on is it's been kind of pretty much in the forefront of experimenting with different ways to uh, both broaden uh, the financial base, because that's a that's a pretty big issue in India, uh, financial inclusion, as well as speeding up payments. So if you think about UPI, that has had a big effect in uh, impact in terms of broadening the financial base, but also sped up a lot of uh, payment processes. We also have systems like IMPS, uh, RTGS, for instance, settlement for the user. So I think they've always been experimenting with different ways to kind of improve and speed in and broaden the base. So from that sense, I think this is just one more al- along that dimension. Now, why I think the RBI is interested in it is because given the characteristics that we mentioned regarding programmability, tracking, all these different features, I think this gives RBI additional options in kind of from building agile payment systems to also influencing monetary policy, right? Like we talked about. So if we, if we start to kind of break that down into its individual components, the first, I think, motivation for RBI is despite its best efforts, despite the government's best efforts in India, cash is still king, right? We've had the demonetization, we've had UPI and all these things. But if you look at the numbers, 
more than 50% of transactions still happen in cash. And if you look at the kind of denomination, less than 500 is is kind of uh, pretty much, I would say 70 to 80% of uh, transactions are still happening in cash, right? So despite the growth of digital payments, cash still remains the preferred mode of payment. And so I think this is one more um, avenue through which RBI hopes that even if it does, I don't think anybody expects cash to be replaced, but at least gives a reasonable complement um, to, to what is there with cash. The second, I think, is more operational, which is we don't really think about it much, but there is a huge operational overhead in terms of uh, the physical cash management itself. So I was just looking at some previous RBI numbers. They mentioned something like uh, last year they spent almost 5,000 crore uh, in terms of just printing, managing, processing, that whole uh, infrastructure of cash and, and how you kind of generate currency, right? And that is only going up year on year because the demand for currency just goes up. Now, with the central bank digital currency or digital rupee, it's definitely going to have a high setup cost up front. But the hope is over time as the infrastructure gets built out, the marginal cost of managing it is going to be much, much less than a physical rupee. So there is that operational element to it as well. And then there is a third element, which again is not so useful for us retail users, but is definitely useful for interbank settlements. So if you think about it, uh, the digital rupee is uh, are considered final, right? Because it is backed by the liability of an RBI. And so then uh, settlements between banks are instantaneous. And so this is going to speed up the process of interbank settlements by, I mean, what, how many ever days it takes now to making it theoretically um, instantaneous. So those, I think, are fairly tangible benefits that the RBI has. And then we can get into some of the more forward-looking things that we talked about, where given enough um, usage of the digital currency, you can start to think about ways that the RBI can actually uh, influence monetary policy beyond just what it does right now, which is raise interest rates in terms of what it lends to the banks, and then that makes its way through the system. This actually gives a more direct mechanism, hyper-precision, targeting, all these things, right? So there are a lot of benefits that can accrue, but I think we're just going to have to feel our way through this because this is very new territory for, for everyone at this point. Right. So one of the, uh, at least while you read conversations around cryptocurrencies, one of it seems that it's being projected as an alternative to cryptocurrencies I mean, when you read about CBDCs, it's being projected as an alternative to cryptocurrencies. and But the two are fundamentally different. So what are the differences and can a central bank issue digital currency be a replacement for a cryptocurrency? Yeah, so I think the central bank digital currencies are not cryptocurrencies by any stretch of imagination. In fact, I would call them exactly the opposite, right? And here's why. So if I, anytime I buy a cryptocurrency, I'm looking for two things. One is I'm looking for anonymization, which is a primary use case. Uh, and second is the distributed ledger is also open, which means everybody can see all the transactions that are happening. Now, if you uh, look back to what how central banks are implementing their digital currencies is exactly the opposite, right? You do have a kind of digital ledger, which is, which is where a lot of the concepts with cryptocurrency come in. But the token itself, it is backed by the state. So unlike cryptos, which which has its own kind of, which doesn't have a clearly defined value, it's the value that is based what everybody else thinks. The cryptos are backed by the state, in which case, in this case, is the RBI. So if you think that the Indian state is a is kind of a reliable, can hold its promises, then, then that has its value same as a rupee, right? So that's number one. But number two, unlike cryptocurrencies, which are decentralized, CBDCs by the definition are completely centralized at the central bank level, right? Like everything flows back to the RBI. And most importantly, all the transactions that are going to be made on CBDC are going to be visible to the central bank. But I don't think you and I are going to have visibility into that particular aspect of, of the digit ledger. So from all these met, uh, kind of elements, you'll see that it's almost like a polar opposite of, of a cryptocurrency. So in a sense, it is almost like the central banks are taking back control of some of the features of um, cryptocurrency and trying to get back into, into the game as it were. Right. So when we look at the Indian context, uh, a lot of why a digital currency issued by the central bank is needed, like when we talk about moving to a cashless society or financial inclusion or avoiding the costs of printing and handling money, 
So all of these are kind of addressed by the UPI. So when we talk about uh, the adoption of a digital rupee now, could UPI then be a hurdle to its adoption? And is there any, uh, does it really give a use case that is very drastically different from UPI? Yeah, so I've I've been thinking about it. And I, I think at least for the retail users, I've not been able to come up with a strong incentive as to why somebody would prefer a digital rupee over a UPI. Right, because if I'm a if I'm an end user today, the UPI transaction is pretty seamless. It's pretty in- instantaneous, also for settlements, and I don't see that much of a difference in terms of the user experience itself. I would still need to open an account with my intermediary bank. It's an HDFC, SBI, whatever it is, and transact through that. So I don't see how that could be that beneficial for the retail users, unless there are use cases that that we are not able to see right now. But again, like we mentioned, the bigger benefit for this digital rupee is going to come for the non-retail use cases, like we talked about wholesale settlements. We've not talked about cross-border payments, which we should talk about as well. Um, That is also another area where it could help. And then finally, I think if if it gets into the programmability of digital rupee, that is where I think there could be some benefits over the UPI. So you can think about cash transfers, subsidy payments, all these things that could be linked to certain conditions in which these are things that UPI cannot do right now. So those are areas where I think UPI can it can definitely have a leg up over UPI. But as it stands today for ordinary transactions, I don't see much of a difference for, for the end consumer. Right. Thanks, Alice. So we'll take a quick commercial break and we'll be back in a couple of uh, seconds. So welcome back. We are talking about central bank digital currencies and uh, taking the conversation forward. Shailish, so if one of the concerns around a central bank digital currency is the anonymity that is that other forms of transactions offer, the uh, CBDC would allow visibility of the transactions, even the specific denominations or the specific units of currency to be tracked. Right. And so what are the implications on privacy and anonymity? For example, if you're using physical cash, it is more or less anonymous. If you're using a UPI transaction, it is still maybe registered at the records of the two banks that are involved. But a digital rupee is directly visible to uh, transactions using a digital rupee will be directly visible to the RBI. So uh, what are the implications on privacy and anonymity? What, What do you think of this? Yeah, so this I think is a real concern and this is one of the areas that we've not had much visibility into, right? So as you mentioned, despite all the drawbacks of cash, it is still the best source for anonymized transactions between two parties. Even if we accept that uh, we now have limits on, on the use of cash beyond which we need to use PAN and things like that, it still remains the best source for anonymous transactions where you don't want kind of the government to know what what, what is happening, right? For, for justifiable reasons. And With CBDC, all the transactions are recorded and are available with the central bank. Now, if you you go back and think about the initial phases, there was a call to actually bake in anonymity in the design itself. But that has not happened. And the RBI has said that there there are good reasons in terms of money laundering, KYC, all these things that they don't want to do that by design. However, they have stressed in at least the policy note that they are looking at different options for maintaining privacy. But again, uh, in the absence of any clear information, this will be a big red flag for ordinary um, kind of consumers to be able to use CBDC uh, to replace cash. Now, there's also a few other things that we have not discussed where cash still still works much better, which is you don't really need an internet connection for cash to work, right? (laughs) And uh, cash also cannot be hacked, both of which are possible with with CBDC depending on, on how it is implemented. So again, I don't think anybody expects the digital rupee to replace cash, but having but not having clarity on, on what the privacy implications are, uh, I think that will definitely impact the usage of it. Right. So finally, one last question. And so we see a lot of uh, countries adopting CBDCs. Now, this is, you mentioned uh, that this could also have an implication on cross-border payments. And uh, uh, you, we have seen at least uh, recently that uh, there's a lot of geopolitics around SWIFT and how it could be used as leverage by a certain group of countries. Now, 
So what are the implications from a geopolitical lens and how do we see this playing out over time uh, when a lot of other countries are adopting CBDCs and how do we see this uh, panning out? Yes, so I think that's a good point, which is traditionally, if you think about it, cross-border payments uh, still involve a lot of friction, uh, friction both in terms of the time involved for the settlement, but also in terms of the overhead fees that are required of the of the end users. So that's number one, like, Cross-border payments definitely need to become a lot easier. And as we have seen in the case with um, Russia and the sanctions, uh, anytime there is uh, there is a there is an event where other countries impose sanctions, immediately it has an impact on the country's ability to trade, primarily through the mechanism of currency currency transfers. So I think CBDCs open up another avenue through which cross-border transactions can happen between countries and gives and gives it a different medium for exchange. Again, uh, I personally don't know how this is going to play out because it, it depends on the implementation of the other currency and how these settlements will happen. But again, it, it gives an additional option for a settlement, one that is not dependent on kind of going back and looking at the cash reserves because that currency itself is backed by by the central bank, right? So I think that is definitely an important avenue. And if you think about it, like you mentioned, uh, I think almost 60 central banks are experimenting with CBDC in different forms. And you look at their justifications, uh, they are very similar to what the RBI has given, uh, either in terms of uh, digital inclusion, making it easy, reducing kind of the burden of, of cash payments. It kind of spans that entire spectrum. But what I feel is happening is rather than the specific reasons, central banks are really kind of dipping their toe into the water to understand what exactly the digital currencies are, how do they think about it, what is the infrastructure needed at this point, so that they can actually, when it really starts to take off, they, they are prepared for it. And like you mentioned, I think the only big country that that has really implemented this at scale is is China. And I think they have set a target uh, that by 2023, which is next year, they want to have a wide adoption of their e-currency. So that's going to be something that's going to be very interesting to to watch as well. Right. Thanks, Shailesh. Uh, This has been a really interesting conversation. Any closing comments before we wind up? No, I think we've, we've covered all the different aspects. But uh, like I said, this is a new area for everybody. So it's going to be interesting. And I do foresee a lot of evolution in terms of our understanding from where we started out today. So it's going to be an interesting space to watch. Right. Thanks uh, so much, Shailesh. And thanks everyone for listening in. And we hope you enjoyed it. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Bharat. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website, takshashila.org.in.